when you turn to the Lord, the Holy Spirit, that veil is removed. Oh, you begin to see something. And then, when that veil is removed, what will happen? Instead of seeing a verse or a doctrine, verse 18, in the Bible, you will see, verse 18, the glory of Jesus. I praise God that when I study the Bible now, I see the glory of Jesus. Even in a simple doctrine like women should veil their heads when they pray or prophesy, which is a big point of argument in Western countries, you can take it as a doctrine and enforce it as a doctrine. And I know what has happened in many um, legalistic churches in the US who enforce it as a doctrine. It's spiritual death. These women sit there with their heads veiled and proud. I've seen that in Pentecostal churches. It's not a revelation. They haven't seen Jesus. They've seen a doctrine. I don't want to see a doctrine in the Bible. I want to see Jesus. I want to see the glory of Jesus. When I see a doctrine, it's because of a veil. You think you've understood it. Yeah, your soul has understood it. Your mind has understood it. But when the veil is removed, you see the glory of Jesus there. Wow! What is the glory of Jesus? The glory of how Jesus submitted to his Father. And it says there, a woman submits to her husband or to the elders in the church and she's covering her head to show this is my glory. You sisters who are covering your head today, do you understand that? Do you, do you understand the meaning of your covering the head? Are you saying, this is my glory? Like Jesus submitted to his Father throughout his earthly life, God made me a woman and called me to submit to my husband and to submit to the elders in the church. Not in a slavish type of way, no. How did Jesus submit to the Father? He was not a slave. He was a happy son. You see, I've explained a little doctrine to you now, which may have been only a doctrine till now. You turn like that to any verse of scripture, the veil is taken away, you will see the glory of Jesus. I read the Gospels and here and there I see the glory of Jesus in something he did, something he did not do. And then what will happen? When I see the glory of Jesus, the next thing that the Holy Spirit does, verse 18 again, he changes me into that same glory. Now I cannot be changed into that glory if I don't see it first. It's not only to one another, uh, not only a woman to a man. Have you read this verse? Husbands, be subject to your wives. Can you show me that verse in the Bible? If you heard me before, you know where it is. Because I preached about it before. All you sisters are excited? Husbands, be subject to your wives in the fear of Christ. Next verse, wives be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. Both are there. If you want to know where it is, don't quote it to your husband. This is for you to meditate on yourself. Like I tell husbands, don't quote to your wives, wives be subject to your husbands. That is written for wives, not for you. Don't read other people's letters. <laughs> what is written for your wife, let her read it. What is written for your husband, let him read it. Don't open somebody else's letter and read it out to the other person. They can read it themselves. Okay, Ephesians 5 verse 21. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Then the wife can be subject to the husband and the husband can love the wife. If they have first come to verse 21. But if you skip over verse 21 and go to verse 22 
you will obey it in a legalistic way and there will be conflict in your home with the wife, husband telling the wife, you must submit to me and the wife saying, but you must love me like Christ loved the church. You are not loving me like Christ loved the church. Why should I submit to you? All these arguments are because they skipped over verse 21. Read the Bible in sequence. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Even children obey your parents. Do you know there are areas where I have to even respect the boundary of my children? They may be my children, even when they are small at home. For example, I cannot punish them publicly if they do something wrong in the presence of guests because that's a double punishment. I spanked them and I humiliated them. I'm not supposed to humiliate them. A child has got a dignity. Correct him for the wrong, but don't humiliate him before others. Spank him later. Or take him to another room. Because he's got a, he's got a boundary of self-respect. I've got to be subject to that boundary even to my children. That's one example. I can't treat the child as if this is my creation. No, God created him. I must, I must respect my children. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Even masters and servants, which goes on to say, I must, be, I must respect the boundary of my servant. I cannot humiliate him. I must pay him what he's due. If you like to get a bonus from your company, how many of you like to get a bonus from your company? Everybody? Don't you think your servant at home should get a bonus from you once in a while? Or you are so legalistic and say, I promise to pay you so much every month and that's it. Imagine if your company spoke to you like that. Treat other people the way you like to be treated yourself. I'll tell you something which I've discovered through many years. Be good to other people and God will be good to you. Be kind to other people God will be kind to you. Treat other people's children well. God will take care of your children. Somebody else somewhere, when your children are far away, they will treat your children well because you treated somebody else's children here. We reap what we sow. But we're not doing it in order to get that reward. No, we do it, it says in verse 21, out of the fear of Christ. Out of reverence for Christ. I do it. Not, if I do this, I'll get something from God. No. In reverence for Christ, I want to be kind to people, good to people, and be subject to the, recognize their boundaries, not humiliate them in any way. Recognize the boundaries of people. Always be respectful to people. Even if it's a porter in a railway station arguing with you about how much you have to pay him for carrying your luggage or an auto rickshaw driver, I'm not saying just give him whatever he wants, but respect him as a human being. We don't shout and yell at people. The same way I want to say to you elders, you also have boundaries. Don't sit up and stand up in the pulpit and yell and scream at all the people in your church as if they are dumb, stupid people. I've heard elders speak like that. That's not God's way. They have got a boundary. Respect it. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. You know that I speak very strongly because Jesus spoke strongly. But I'll tell you, I always speak with the respect. I speak with the respect. I'm, if I expose the humbugs, I'll tell you how I speak with the respect that in 1,000 sermons of mine on YouTube, you'll never find me mention anybody's name. That's how I respect. Jesus never spoke about Annas and Caiaphas. And no, he said Pharisees, Sadducees. So I may speak about pastors and money-loving preachers, but I don't mention anybody's name, even though I know their names. I will not mention it. It's a matter of respect. I recognize my boundary. So we have to be very careful. 
and don't go into a ministry that God has not called you. I've often told people, don't try to preach what the way I preach because God may not have called you to preach and emphasize the things I emphasize. Recognize your own boundary. Respect one another in the fear of Christ. So if we follow these simple principles, the Holy Spirit will keep on giving us revelation and we will discover what God has prepared for those who love him.